let's focus on facial wounds. Some of the most important cosmetic results you have to focus on are wounds of the face. And a very important part of our job is to give this patient the best results uh, from a facial wound that they can get. Uh, many of these are blunt. Uh, they're falls, uh, they're in children. Uh, our most common uh, places in children are the chin lacerations and the edge of the eyebrow uh, lacerations. Really, really common. These should be well within uh, your work and doing very quick repairs. Um, the chin wound in particular is not amenable to taping and gluing. And any wounds near the eye, using glue around the eye, it's not a very good choice. The chin wounds typically are deep enough that they're right down uh, onto the edge of the mandible. Um, these are wounds that you have to know how to move quickly through uh, because this child's not going to stay still uh, for any length of time. And so, again, excellent techniques working as fast as possible. Uh, and this is also a very dirty area where use of subcutaneous tissue, uh, subcutaneous sutures is probably not the best choice. Uh, where use uh, for the typical wound, which is less than two centimeters, maybe two and a half centimeters, uh, where just simple, good, interrupted sutures gives the best outcome for the patient in the shortest time that you have. You also have to be very good at being able to hit a moving target and working with children around the chin. Uh, and so you set everything up so that you're ready to hop on the kid, get everything done very, very quickly that you can. Topical anesthesia first, sometime injection anesthesia next. Uh, the typical chin laceration requires three or four interrupted sutures done very, very quickly. As we move up and then move into different age groups, uh, a very, very important laceration that you close uh, carefully is a laceration that involves the lip itself and the vermilion border. In a wound involving the vermilion border, there's only one suture that is important, and that is the one which reapproximates the vermilion border. Uh, and so do what you want with the lip laceration that's an element of it and the skin laceration that's an element. Uh, the money, the money procedure here is exactly replacing the vermilion border back in line. If you don't do that correctly, it is very difficult for anybody to repair later on uh, and, and to realign the vermilion border edges. Uh, so it is really important that no matter what age the patient is, uh, that you're ready to get that one important suture that realigns the vermilion border. If you have lost part of the vermilion border um, because of, uh, of a tear type of wound, unfortunately a dog bite uh, type of wound, where they have lost the vermilion border, what you need to do is modify that wound so that you get to two clean edges of vermilion border that can be repaired back together in a way that has the least tensile strength. That's difficult to do, uh, but involves typically, again, you make an additional incision and removal of non-viable tissue so that you can get to the point where the vermilion border can be put back together on either the lower or the upper edge. The edges of the nose, very difficult to anesthetize. You may use a regional block to maximize your ability to get a nose wound that is closed involving the ala here. Uh, you need to reapproximate those uh, very carefully, again, so that you have a nice smooth edge to the nose on any of its surfaces that gives the patient the best cosmetic repair uh, in the end. As we move up close to the eye, getting close to the eyelids themselves uh, gets to more and more complicated uh, use of plastics techniques, making sure that there are no deep structures involved, including the tear ducts and making sure that if there's cartilage damage uh, to the eyelid itself, uh, that that person goes off to an appropriate specialist. If you're left repairing the skin wound and then sending off the patient uh, to referral for, um, for deep structure involvement, um, you're gonna use very small suture material on a very small needle in this very delicate area of the, of the body. Then we get to our much more frequent uh, edge of eyebrow, forehead lacerations. There's nothing better than the forehead laceration that is in line with the skin tension lines. Any wound that is vertical to the skin tension lines is going to result in a much larger scar no matter how well you do with your closure techniques, prepare the patient for that. Uh, in closing these areas here, 
uh, local anesthesia is sometimes very effective. Sometimes you need to do the regional block with the superorbital nerve block uh, that can work very effectively for this entire area. Um, in the forehead, great vascular supply, and you know that because all these wounds come in very, very bloody. Uh, these are wounds which react very well to good subcutaneous use of sutures. So you use subcuticular sutures with an absorbable material. You close them down to where you have a very a very loose skin edge that can be closed very rapidly and very quickly. If you have good subcuticular opposition of the skin edges, uh, you can use staples, you can use a running suture, whatever, whatever you can do very, very quickly uh, to close these wounds up in here on the forehead, making sure again uh, that if there's anything that's within um, that's opposing the lines of tension, uh, that you get good subcutaneous bite and closure there with a low risk of infection. Up into the scalp, the scalp itself, extraordinarily vascular and extraordinarily difficult to close. There's very little in the way of subcutaneous tissue to oppose. You have to get good bite on the scalp itself, oftentimes using big sutures. Typically in this area, scarring not as important, uh, but for men, this can be important even if they have some skin now, uh, or even if they have hair now, because later on they, they may bald that spot out and they want, they want a good scar there. Uh, so you do your best. I am not one that, that uh, shaves off large areas. I remove only the hair that is necessary for me to do my job and to make sure no hair is stuck into the wound uh, up in the scalp area here. I just trim it away with my scissors. I get to the skin edges that I need. I remove non-viable uh, tissue that oftentimes is a part of a scalp wound. And then big, big uh, choices, uh, sometimes vertical mattress sutures to hold the scalp together is a really good idea for big scalp wounds. Uh, so that covers our, our uh, face and scalp area of wound closures. Uh, just for a second, I wanna talk about neck wounds. And the first thing that has to happen in any neck wound uh, that you're faced with is what is damaged down underneath the skin. Uh, very, very important, and there's specialized forms of workup done uh, for neck wounds that are really important for you to have um, in your workup with the surgical teams that you work with or the trauma center that you work with. Uh, a neck wound, unless it's a really lucky little glancing blow with a, a little piece of glass or a, or a knife that accidentally came across them, very important that you focus more on what's underneath uh, than on the repair of the tissue of the neck. So that's head, neck, face, very important part of our wound closure techniques.